I'm going to be talking to Dr. Matthew Dubery, who is the professor of the Hawaii National Energy Institute at the University of Hawaii about lithium iron phosphate batteries, which are becoming not as well known as nickel manganese cobalt batteries, but are becoming much more common. So welcome to the interview, Matthew. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. Look, can we start with an overview of what LFP is, please? Sure. So lithium iron phosphate is a battery material that I've been known for probably around 20 years now. I think it actually predates the cobalt-based materials we have now. Not the lithium cobalt oxide, but the other materials like batteries now uh, appeared after LFP. So it's a really stable material. It has a really nice voltage plateau around 3.4 volts. And one of the main benefits is that it doesn't have any uh, cobalt, nickel, or manganese. So in terms of environment, it's much more friendlier and bad with materials. And also in terms of geopolitics, where cobalt is not available for uh, many countries. So that's why it's gained interest now. Now, the, I understand that LFP has cost advantage, advantages over the other batteries that use the critical uh, minerals. Um, what kind of cost advantages are we talking about? Well, that's not my specialty at all. So I'm not quite sure about uh, how to answer that. I'm, I mean, iron is pretty cheap. Phosphates are, are fairly cheap as well. So if you compare that to um, cobalt, manganese, or, and uh, mostly cobalt and, and nickel that are really expensive metals. So in that aspect, the raw materials are, are considerably cheaper. Now, what are some of the other advantages of LFP? I, I understand that uh, higher cycle life, for instance. Yes, uh, mainly two advantages. The, the cycle life is one of them. Uh, the, basically, in that material, you only have one phase transformation, so it's the, you can do, lithium can go back and forth easily without too much strain. That's why you have a long cycle life. And also, because that lithium can go in and out easily, it's usually considered a high power material, meaning that you can put a lot of current on it uh, without too much problems, which is absolutely not the case for over cobalt but cobalt-based materials. Does that mean that with uh, LFP batteries and electric vehicles, for instance, that we could have uh, you know, faster uh, uh, charging times? Well, yes and no. You also need to consider the negative electrode. Uh, so yes, you can go really fast on the positive, but if you cannot go really fast on the negative, you cannot really also uh, do fast charge. And, and the limitation for fast charge is mostly on the negative and to avoid issues like uh, lithium plating and all those aspects. So, um, it could help, definitely, but it's not the, the magical recipe to, to have battery that can charge in two minutes next year. Now, uh, I understand that LFP has a higher power density. Now, we often hear about energy density of batteries, but maybe you could explain power density, please. Uh, sure. So first, you have to realize that all those materials, they have a specific voltage as will their, their function. And your typical uh, cobalt battery is around the Average voltage is probably around 3.9, 4 volts. Uh, LFP is much lower than that. The average voltage is probably around 3.5 volts, 3.4 volts. And so if you think of energy, energy is going to be the capacity times the voltage. So LFP also has a less capacity per mole than those other materials. So in terms of energy, it's, it's not as good because you have a lower voltage and you have a lower capacity. So when you multiply both of them, that's energy, it's obviously lower than, than for cobalt-based materials. But you, you can go really, really fast. So even though you have those limitations, power-wise, when you just apply the current times the voltage, yes, you have a lower voltage, but you can apply a lot of current. So in terms of power, it's better, but in terms of energy, it's not as good. And the safety, of course, is a big concern with uh, NMC batteries. But I understand that with LFP batteries, uh, higher safety and lower toxicity, uh, toxicity, sorry. Is that correct? Toxicity, yes. Safety, it's, yeah, it's a bit safer. It's really going to depend on the additives you have in them. Um, but yeah, in terms of the energy released during thermal runaway, uh, LFP batteries are really less energy than uh, cobalt-based battery. But that doesn't mean that they cannot catch on fire. Uh, but that depends on the additives. Some manufacturers have showed additives for LFE batteries that prevent competitive thermal runaway. So it's really going to be uh, depending on the manufacturer. You cannot really generalize um, that. But 
the truth is if less voltage, so you, st you store less energy. So obviously if it fails, it's gonna be less energy. Now with the lower toxicity, does that mean that LFP batteries will be easier to recycle? Uh, yes, but I'm not sure the toxicity is the reason. It's, it's a completely different structure than the, than the cobalt oxide batteries. So it's a completely different type of material. So I think the recycling for LFP is easier. I'm not sure if it's because of the toxicity or just because the, if it's a phosphate and it's a completely different uh, structure and completely different chemistry than the cobalt-based batteries. But it is easier to recycle. And but to some degree, it's more recycled than, than cobalt-based batteries already. Now, I, I understand that LFPs have roughly 50% of the energy density of uh, an, an MC battery. But I, is it the case that uh, with uh, uh, changes to the, I think it's the anode, uh, that that can be brought up to about 70%, uh, 75% of an NMC battery? Uh, well, no, because they have the same negative electrode. So if you change the negative electrode for the LFP, if, if you change it the same way for the NMC, you're going to get the same result. Uh, it's really intrinsic to the material. It's, it's correspond to the amount of lithium you can put in compared to the mass of your material. So that's, that's a set theoretical number. Um, I think LFP is around 130 milliamp hour per gram. And uh, the I, I nickel NMC materials are around 180 or 200. So you can, that's nature. You cannot go uh, on that. Now, I understand that LFP batteries are already commonly used in, in China for scooters and, and small uh, EVs. Uh, how extensive uh, are they used there? Uh, as far as I understand, yes, we have some quite a bit of EVs that are LFP based over there uh, in, in Scooter 2. And it's been used in power tools for a long time as well. So commercially, those batteries have been available for, for quite a long time. Even in the US, there have been some US manufacturers that produce those batteries uh, 10 to 15 years ago. Now, I understand that some of the uh, automakers like Tesla and VW are, uh, are moving to LFP batteries. What's the, um, what's the reason for that? Well, um, I'm not sure, I'm not in their shoes. I think partially the reason is, depending on what EV you're making, you might not need a lot of range. And maybe for small EVs that are meant to stay in the city, uh, LFP batteries might be good because you don't need as much range as the um, vehicles that are meant to go in between cities. So, to some degree, I think, yeah, you, you, you gain advantage of safety. It's easier to recycle. It's less toxic. And I think for some uh, driving downtown, it's a, it's a perfect battery. If you don't do 200 miles per day, it's perfectly fine. So I think they start to realize that you cannot have one single battery for every application. And you might not want to use the same battery uh, in Montreal than in Honolulu. Uh, obviously, the weather conditions are completely different. The, the roads are completely different. So it's probably an effort to adapt the battery to the road condition to maximize life and, and safety too. Uh, to a, a layperson like myself who isn't an electrochemist, uh, it's, it looks like there's beginning to be a, a, a movement to or a settling out of different electric, different chemistries, battery chemistries for different applications. Is that a fair comment to make? Oh yes, and, and that's absolutely expected. Um, Battery degradation, lithium ion battery degradation is extremely complex and it's going to depend. It's, it's called path dependent. And that means that depending on how you use the battery, it's going to degrade differently. And it's not just losing capacity slower and faster, that's really the internal mechanism that are completely different. And that could lead to sudden death of a battery or not. And sometimes the difference is really, really subtle. And that's also to add to the complexity, that's also chemistry dependent. So every battery chemistry gonna be really sensitive to some stress and not sensitive to others. And some of the chemistry may be the complete opposite. So if you think of for an electric vehicle, uh, the temperature is, is gonna be a big growth and the, the road conditions, somebody that's gonna be driving the car mostly on a like open highways, it's not gonna be the same degradation as somebody that spent years in traffic or that's gonna drive on a mountain road or they're gonna drive only flat uh, roads. So all of that is gonna affect the degradation. And so some batteries might be 
really good for some condition and really bad for others. Now you've done uh, a fair amount of research on degre degradation. Are, can you tell us a little bit about your work? Of course. So we specialize in diagnosis and prognosis for lithium ion. And we develop techniques to do that in operando, meaning that we don't require to open the cells. We don't require to do anything destructive to the cell. We really focus on trying to develop method that we can apply on any battery out there. So what we do is we analyze the voltage response of the cell. You don't realize it, but when you look at the voltage of a lithium ion battery, you see a lot of change of slope and some plateaus or some slopes, and it's not a monotonic decrease of the voltage. And that's information. That's basically what you see is the change of structure in the electrodes. All the lithium is accommodated inside the crystallographic structure of the positive and the negative electrode. And so we develop techniques to kind of use that information to go back to other cell degraded. And we can we cannot tell you exactly what happened, but we can tell on, on if some lithium is lost. The lithium amount in your battery is finite. So if something eats some lithium, uh, we need to know it because that's going to induce capacity loss. So we can quantify that. We, we cannot tell you why we use non-destructive methods, but we can quantify how much lithium is lost or how much material is lost or if the kinetic of your battery is degraded. So we developed a set of tools to diagnose cells really efficiently just based on the voltage response of the cell. What are the kind of the, the real world applications for, for that research, uh, Matthew? All right. it, it, will it uh, be primarily for electric vehicles maybe, or is uh, stationary batteries or all kinds of lithium ion batteries? Oh, it's for, for every lithium ion, and you can extend that to sodium ion or any other new fancy batteries they're going to come up with. Uh, I mean, there's many applications. Obviously, one of the main applications is for us in the lab when we test the impact of different conditions, or I mean, us or any other battery manufacturer, when we test batteries to see are they going to be what's happening when the battery is at high temperature, what's happening when the battery is uh, discharged really, really fast. And, What's the degradation and can we prognose that? Does it gonna to lead to thermal runaway later? So we can use the technique for that. Since it's all only voltage-based, we can also embed the technique into the battery management system so that your battery can constantly try to self-diagnose itself and to be able to flag if, some, if we start to see a degradation path that might lead to a failure, drastic failure, it could automatically flag and detect that it's gonna fail soon. Is, uh, is it fair to say, and this is certainly my impression, you know, looking at your, your industry, but is it fair to say that the longer life, better performance, lower cost of batteries is so, to some extent, maybe a longer extent, dependent upon the kind of analytical, uh, analytics work that you're doing so that you take a battery that uh, you know, maybe has a lithium ion NMC or an LFP chemistry, but it, it performs so much better and longer because it's managed better using your the software and your kind of analytics uh, approach. Yeah, I mean, a, a lot goes to understanding what condition that battery like or don't like. And I, I could show you an example where we took actually a study we did on the LFP battery, which we found was really interesting, where we took one cell where we did fast charge and fast discharge. So we fully charge and fully discharge in 15 minutes. So it's really fast for a battery. And for the same cell, I mean, another cell, the same batch, we still charge in 15 minutes, but for the discharge, we simulated driving for three hours. So on paper, that's far less aggressive. But the results, the cell that did the driving died after 600 cycles. The cell that did the fast charge and discharge lasted 5,000 cycles. So just to show you that sometimes even a less aggressive cycle could degrade that cell. So it's really important to understand how to test the cells, because obviously in that scenario, we could have say, oh, that cell lasts 5,000 cycles and sell it to some EV manufacturer, where in fact, if you use it for driving, it's not the case, it's gonna die right away. So it's really important to do a lot of testing to understand what are the condition that cell is good for. And then if you do that, then you can deploy it and it's gonna last forever. But even sometimes a small change in the condition could mean that the cell is gonna die after a year instead of 10. So it, it, analytics plays a role to monitor, but a lot of work has to come beforehand in the lab to understand what conditions 
scatter what degradation from the cells. Andrew, what are the uh, top two issues or trends uh, in your work that you'll be dealing with over, say, the, the next decade? Well, I mean, the battery field is really, really broad. So it's, it's I mean, are you talking about materials? Are you talking about controls? Uh, it's, it's, it's really broad. For my field is more on the control on the battery intelligence uh, side of thing. And I think the key there is gonna be how to add some material science understanding to all those algorithms. Because it's really easy to develop algorithm to monitor data. But if you cannot link that to what happened inside the battery in terms of where the lithium goes or what's happening in the battery, it's never gonna be successful. So to me, the big job is to link having conversations between material scientists and understand what's happening inside the battery and people that are really good at building and grave them and doing all that machine learning. I don't think battery, the battery is a one-man world anymore. You need a team of people that are specialists on their own little thing and they learn to communicate together to get results. Um, are there any you know, maybe one or two if, examples, if you have them, of uh, really exciting developments in batteries, particularly LFP, that we might see in the next five or 10 years? Um, LFP, I mean, honestly, on, on the research side of things, I haven't seen much work on LFP in the past decade. Uh, LFP was, every publication was on LFP 10 years ago. Uh, since then, LFP is not that many publications on it. I think, I mean, our publication that I uh, told you before, where we simulate the driving or the, or the fast charge, I think that one is a really, I think, important paper for the field because it shows the path dependence. I think in terms of diagnosis, some synthetic data for LFP. So we use our method to simulate a lot of voltage curve. And we simulated every possible degradation. We don't know if it's possible in real life. We don't know what could cause those degradation, but we simulated every possible degradation. And we upload that data for free. Anyone can download it. And the goal is to help people validate algorithm. So they can take that LFP data with 700,000 individual voltage curve, and they can try the algorithm to see if they can diagnose it correctly. But to me, that's a big development for the field when we have a more and more data-driven methods. And it's great, those methods are fantastic, but they need good training data. You cannot expect to test one or two batteries and develop an algorithm that's gonna be universal. That's why we invested a lot of time and effort to develop those synthetic data sets so that we can give people that doesn't necessarily know how to test cells or have the resources of the time to test a lot of batteries under different conditions. We can take our synthetic data and validate whatever algorithm they have. If it's, it can be machine learning, it can be a normal algorithm or anything they want, but they have a big data set they can use to validate. And to me, that's really exciting for the future to keep providing those synthetic data under different conditions. We can simulate different temperature, we can simulate different rates, we can simulate a lot of different aspects. So people can try and make sure their algorithm is valid under any given conditions, which is extremely important. Again, going back to my example of changing the condition a little bit might completely degrade the cell differently. So you must be able to flag that with your algorithm. So I think to me, what really interests me uh, these days is those synthetic cycles and how to replicate the battery, having better models that we can, that are not calculation intensive. So we can do millions of calculations to validate any possible algorithm. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing your insights. Really appreciate it. Oh, you're more than welcome. Always happy to talk about the battery industry.